Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, six in a row, two of the best and target schmargets as long as we win. It's all next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus different infections. Get yours today at Jace Medical. That's J A S E Medical.com. Hitting hard as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We ask you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. Also, check us out on the Sirius XM app and give me a follow on my personal twi- Twitter page at JMCH316. Well, six in a row now for the Braves. Are we still concerned about the division or whatever like that? Didn't we talk about this three months ago? on the podcast and all this, and we proclaimed it. Look, I can't even proclaim something and be hot takey and not have it come true, right? So again, we talked about this a few months ago. Was the division ever really in doubt? I think that I saw a stat that said the the only day that the Braves were not in first place was game number three for the season. And we talked about it, whether it was July or June and the all-star, I mean, the division's never been in doubt. I mean, it's it's been a situation where the Braves have controlled this thing the whole way through, right? They've been the best team in the National League, best team in baseball. They've done everything that they could do. You know, again, last night was a perfect situation where, you know, you, you looked at, okay, Braves got out front early. Austin Riley hits a two-run homer in the first inning. They do what they do best. They mash the ball all over the yard, right? And Strider come out, and he was a little bit, you know, shaky. A couple of walks. He gave up a run in the first, right? But then he settled in, and he had seven innings and only four hits and just the one run. Still only had the couple of walks that he gave up in the first inning, but he had nine strikeouts when it was all said and done. And now, by the way, he moves to 17-5 and on the year with a 373 ERA and about a million strikeouts. So, again, this has been the best team in baseball, and we've talked about this. Look, this has to go the right way. This cannot be a repeat of 2003, okay? this I don't want to hear about short series and all this other kind of stuff, you know, and now we'll be the best team in baseball. I think we're six and a half games up on the Dodgers with, like, 16 to play, and I'll be interested to see what they do the rest of the way just from the standpoint of I do think when they head down to Miami – this weekend. So they'll get a, a needed day off, you know, because again, they'll probably celebrated and probably had some fun last night, needed day off today. Then they'll head down to play the fish nets and that'll be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. But not only that, but I wouldn't be surprised if Snitker does some resting of some of his positional players. Part of it is look, they've clinched the division. You want to give some guys some rest, then ramp them back up. Right. Part of it is too, is that they're playing, by, by and large, three day games. I mean, 640, I guess, on Friday, but uh, Saturday is a four o'clock in the afternoon game and Sunday is a one o'clock in the afternoon game. Now, I don't know what the weather forecast has been in Miami, but I'm going to guess it's this way. It's hot. I mean, it's been smoldering up here. Why would it not be smoldering down in Miami? So you might want to give some guys off just to make sure, hey, get a little bit of rest, stay hydrated, you know, what have you. And again, I'm going to be interested to see what they do with their pitching staff. You know, instead of some guys at five days, do they push them back to a sixth day or what have you? So again, Snitker can now do what he likes. The division's clinched. They're going to be the number one seed. Again, look at their schedule over the next, you know, from now to the end of the year. It's the fishnets. We talked about seven of their last 10 are against the um, Washington Nationals, who are a dreadful disgrace of a franchise. They'll play the Phillies coming up at home starting next week. Now, the Phillies got something to play for. They're still trying to get into the playoffs and make a wild card run. 
but obviously the division is all over. And you wonder about what Philadelphia thinks about all this. But anyway, look, the Mutts, the Phillies, nobody made this thing close. And, and there were a lot of teams that were, again, we went into this year looking at, okay, this could be the best division in baseball. This could be the most competitive division in baseball. I thought one of the toughest things for this roster was going to be the division because, again, look, last year, obviously, the Mets and Braves tied for the division lead, but because the Mets lost the head-to-head -head series against the Braves, that's why they lost the division. So I really thought, and, of course, Philadelphia was in the World Series last year. I really thought that the division would play itself out much closer than what it has, but it's been a laugher. And we've talked about, you know, hey, look, these teams can't beat the Braves head-to-head. -head. And that's been the difference for the last couple few years in the divisional race is because Philadelphia and the Mutts and the Marlins, they can't beat the Braves head-to-head. -head. And if you can't beat your division rival head-to-head, -head, again, you're playing catch-up the whole time when you're trying to play the Pirates and they're playing, you know, the, the, the you know, I don't know, the, the Scuzzbag A's and you're playing the – I mean – Again, when you have to try to, you know, play other teams to try to catch up, makes it tough when you can't beat a team head to head. But at the end of the day, the Braves got it done. This has been one of the more remarkable seasons for the Atlanta Braves. I mean, this has literally been maybe the best lineup one through nine the Braves have ever trotted out there. Again, they've gotten great pitching performances, even all through the injuries. You know, we've bad a lot of injuries in the first part of the year and the first month or so of the season, and they've overcome all of it, not just to their pitching staff, but obviously there were several guys that missed time as far as positional players, Michael Harris and Orlando Arcia, and they had guys that were missing time at the beginning of the year. And obviously Freed and Wright, you know, Wright's still not back yet, you know, you know, cranking things up. Freed has just come back over the last month or so here. And they were pretty much facing only three pitchers, but two of those guys ended up making the all-star game. So it's been a remarkable season for the Atlanta Braves. And now we just have to continue this journey and this ride. I will be interested to see how Snicker handles things moving forward because, again, he's got carte blanche now. Like, he can, he can adjust his lineups. He can adjust his pitching staff. He's got everything at his disposal now. They've clinched so early in the division that there's no fear and you're not having to scramble to win games and all this, that, and the other. Yeah, I mean, you want to win games. You want to keep your momentum and all that kind of stuff. But there's not a burning desire to have to try to win baseball games. They've got a nice lead over the Dodgers for the best record, you know, in all of Major League Baseball. And again, these teams don't beat the Braves head-to-head. -head. Philly can't beat the Braves. The Marlins can't beat the Braves. Washington can't beat the Braves. So you've got all of that factored in, and I'm going to be curious just to see how the rest of the season plays out. Hey, look, Matt Olson's got a shot at, at 60 homers. Does he get enough playing time? Because, again, you can't rest everybody, right? I mean, again, everybody can't sit on the bench as a starter, and, and again, unless you're going to have Rizal Iglesias play third base, okay, everybody can't sit. But, again, you can give some guys some time off. I'm going to be curious to see just how they handle some of these individual records. Do you keep playing Ronnie to make sure he wins the MVP? Do you give Matt Olson a chance to get to 60 home runs? Do you give guys an opportunity to pad some personal stats and things like that? That's what I'll be interested in seeing because, again, that's really what you're playing for at this point, right? You're not playing for seeding. You're not playing to win the division. You're not playing for – and you're the best team in baseball. It's been clear and obvious that they've been the best team in baseball this season. So we'll see what happens, but congratulations to the Braves. Six straight divisions. And when you have teams in your division that can't ever beat you, it's a warm blanket surrounding your shoulders that you feel good about it, that, again, this run doesn't have to end anytime soon. And, of course, this Braves team is going to be together for a whole bunch of years. So good luck to anybody trying to win the NL East from here on out because the Braves, I do believe, are here to stay. 
All right, this episode is brought to you by our new friends over at Jace Medical. And listen, everybody should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And that's why Jace Medical offers the Jace case. The Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you peace of mind so that you're not just hoping that you have the access to the medication in an emergency, right? We fight, fight supply chains and all the different things. Jace Medical makes sure you have the medication in hand. Jace Medical is very simple, okay? They handle everything from the online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. So don't get caught unprepared. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical, plus an additional $20 off by using the code LOCKEDON at checkout. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com, promo code Locked on. Don't get caught without your antibiotics and medication. Go to jacemedical.com, J A S E medical.com, promo code locked on. So, this we'll talk about the game coming up here on Sunday. Tomorrow, we'll preview Falcons and Packers because this is a very intriguing matchup. Like, this is one of those matchups that, again, it's not going to decide the division and the conference standings and and all that kind of stuff this early on but this is a very intriguing game falcons obviously with a big win at home first time since 2017 that they started out one and oh packers are feeling really good about themselves jordan love was terrific three touchdowns no turnovers they blew out the bears who were going to feel good about themselves the bear or sorry the uh, packers just punched them right in the mouth Justin Fields took four sacks, had an interception, had a fumble. Packers are feeling good. But this game does feature, and, and it's going to be interesting to see who wins the battle. This is two of the best offensive lines in the NFL. According to Pro Football Focus going in to week number two, the Falcons come in as the eighth best offensive line in the NFL. Matthews, Bergeron, Dolman, Lindstrom, McGarry. They put a couple of notes on here. They said rookie left guard Matt Bergeron struggled against the Panthers, especially in run blocking. He earned a negative grade on 22% of run plays, which is one of the worst rates in the league over the past week. I'm not worried about his run blocking, okay? We did talk about this the other day that, um, you know, the pass blocking is a little bit of a concern, especially McGarry. Let's see if he can grow and things like that. But again, the Bears gave up four sacks in that game. So I, I look at that as part part of that is Justin Fields, just the way he plays. He runs himself into a whole bunch of sacks. So, again, when he's running around and all these kind of things, he runs himself into some sacks. So I don't know enough to tell you about what the game looked like that was at the Packers defensive line getting after it or did Fields run himself into some sacks. But they had four sacks, and we had two. So the the Falcons come in as the eighth-rated offensive line uh, from Pro Football Focus. The Packers come in as number two, Bakhtiari, Jenkins, Myers, Runyon, and Zach Tom. They said the Packers led the NFL week one with a 96.7% uh, or 967 pass blocking efficiency rating as they allowed just two pressures and did not give up a single sack on 30 dropbacks. And they say after practicing uh, at one position for most of the season, Zach Tom posted the highest single game grade of his young career, 84.8. He did not allow a single pressure and earned just one negative grade in the run game. And they talk about who their best offense lineman is. That's Bakhtiari. I mean, look, he's one of the best overall offensive linemen, regardless of position or anything like that. He's one of the probably five best offensive linemen for the last handful of years in the NFL. So again, we talk about, you know, and we're going to talk about targets and offensive. Again, all that stuff's meaningless. This game will be won by what offensive line can keep the other out of the backfield and hitting their quarterback. This game will be won 
in the trenches line of scrimmage. We can talk about all of the positional pieces and all this and the other. Falcons are going to have to be great again in the red zone. I mean, again, we'll talk about this, you know, more tomorrow in depth, but Falcons will have to be great in the red zone. But these are two teams that really are two of the best offensive lines in the NFL. And they control the line of scrimmage. They control running the football. They protect their quarterback. Now, again, we'll see. You know, I, I believe Desmond Ritter is still going to be somewhere around, you know, 22 to 24 passes. I don't think that he's going to huck it around. It's not what they do, right? Their offense is not drop back, throw it around like Matt Ryan. So, again, this will be a battle that is one up front. We could talk about all of the glamour positions and all this and Robinson and, you know, this and that and whatever targets and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, this will be a classic battle of who's winning in the trenches, whose offensive line can keep the defense out of the backfield in the run game off of their quarterback. And we'll see. I mean, again, it'll be interesting to see, but this is certainly two of the best offensive lines in the NFL. There's a lot of star power. Lindstrom is a stud. Bakhtiari is a first team, all NFL kind of guy. Like there's a lot of star power on these offensive lines for both of these teams. And whoever gets the best of that, whoever can keep guys out of the backfield from blowing up running plays, whoever can keep guys off of the other team's quarterback. And that's going to be a big key is can the Falcons get after Jordan Love? You know, they were not able to put consistent pressure on Bryce Young, but fortunately, he played like a rookie. He missed a lot of throws. Again, that throw on first down when they were backed up at the goal line off of that, you know, that that horse collar play, that was a throw that if Bryce Young hits that guy in stride, that guy's off to the races. He might have scored a touchdown there. And now you have a completely different game at that point. But as it was, you know, he missed it. And he missed some other throws in the game, too, that, again, maybe a Jordan Love doesn't miss. Maybe one of the better quarterbacks doesn't miss. But these are two of the best offensive lines in the NFL, and a lot of this game will be dictated by who gets the better of the other team's defensive line. All right, as you listen in to Hitting Hard, make sure you go into whatever podcast platform that you're listening on. Let us know that you're an everyday listener to the show. We do thank you so much for being a part of of our community, but let us know on whatever podcast platform that you listen on that you're an everyday listener to the show. You're listening in five days a week. So an interesting article from Josh Kendall of The Athletic talking about just the patience that Arthur Smith had and obviously the idea of not being, you know, not targeting a, a lot of their guys. Um, he brings up the fact that he says the Falcons were extremely patient against the Panthers. Quarterback Desmond Ritter's first four passes were behind the line of scrimmage. He threw only two passes further than 10 yards in the air, none farther than 15 yards in the air through the first three quarters of the game. And he says Atlanta finished the week 31st in air yards per attempt according to True Media. Now, Arthur Smith had some interesting comments about all of this, saying, quote, we could have thrown a lot of go routes. Carolina threw a lot of them in the stands. You can go that route, but we were trying to win the game. And he talks about, you know, he talked about the idea in his press conference the other day about their defensive line was dictating some things to the Falcons offense that didn't allow them to throw deep and they had to change up what their game plan was. He says, that's what coaching is. That's what the national football league is. It's 60 minutes. It's not just the physical aspect. It's the mental conditioning too. We've, uh, we adjusted a few things against Carolina about who we were trying to attack and who we were trying to run at and not let them get loose in their pass rush. Ding, 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 ding. Because in the first half of that game, Brian Burns was blowing up every play. Derek Brown's in the backfield. Again, they have all of these, you know, Shaq Thompson. I mean, look, they have a really good defensive line. And this will be one of the better defensive lines 
that they played all year long in, in Carolina. But again, the Packers got four sacks. And again, there may have to be some adjustments. But the idea is, look, target schmargets. I don't care if Drake London doesn't have targets, if they don't target Kyle Pitts very much. Do I want them to be able to be in the red zone and target those guys? Yes. Again, if Drake London has four catches for 20 yards but two touchdowns, I'll take that every week. I'll take it. I'll take a win every week no matter what. So, again, I'm not worried about targets and things like that. Arthur's explaining it to you. He's talking about the idea of you have to be patient. You, you can't let, you know, again, what a team is dictating to you on, on their defensive line and you react in a negative way. He says, quote, when you're ahead and you feel in control of the game, maybe you don't want to give them a chance to hold the ball on a seven-step drop back uh, for a sack fumble or lose the game. Shame on me if we let them go off for nine or ten um, sacks. That's just me being hard-headed. You have to adapt and win the game. And he understood that, that, again, Burns was blowing plays up in the backfield. He was hitting his quarterback. You, you don't get hard-headed about what you're doing. You have to be able to adjust. Look, I give Arthur Smith all the credit in the world that he is adjusting. We, we did, The previous regime didn't do any of this kind of stuff, right? That's why we were so bad in the third quarter and the second half of games. We never adjusted. And why do you think, again, the last few years of Dan Quinn's regime, we, we had three five-game losses in a six in, in, in six seasons with Dan. It's hard to lose five games in a row, but we found a way to do it. Not once, not twice, but three times in six years. So I give Arthur all the credit in the world. I mean, forget Drake London's targets. Again, if he has four catches for 20 yards and two touchdowns, I'll take that every day of the week. If Kyle Pitts is three catches for... 11 yards and two touchdowns, I'll take that every day of the week. But you can't get out of what you do best, and you can't get your quarterback pummeled back there. And this is going to be one of those things that, again, I didn't see enough of the Packers game to tell you about whether or not their defensive front was dominating or if Justin Fields was running him into sacks. But here's what I know. At the end of the day, when I go to ESPN.com, Justin Fields took four sacks in that game. We can't allow... Desmond Ritter to take six or eight sacks. You play ball control. You don't throw the football in, in harm's way. And again, part of that was too is you don't turn the football over. And, and he didn't turn the football over. That's going to be the key stat to look at with Desmond Ritter. Are we going to be efficient in the red zone? And does he turn the football over? Because the last quarterback that we had last year was a turnover machine. So again, I give Arthur all the credit in the world that he was patient. He adjusted. They didn't put Desmond Ritter in harm's way. And we've talked about that all offseason. You don't put your young quarterback in harm's way to be bullheaded or stubborn or whatever like that. You get into what you do best, right? You get into what your playing personality is. Our playing personality is to not turn the football over, run the football effectively. And we had two running backs that had over five yards per attempt when they ran the football. Say what you will about the Falcons' pass blocking grades. We talked about the pro football focus grades from this past week. They weren't good. By the way, B. John Robinson was not good in pass protection. Do you know what his pass protection grade was from pro football focus? Cinco, five. That was his pass protection grade. You thought Lindstrom was bad at 16-7. His grade was five. Now, again, he's a good pass blocker. He was a good pass blocker in college. But again, you don't put your quarterback in harm's way. And you do what you do best. You're playing personality. Don't turn the football over. Let's be great in the red zone. Let's run the football. Run the football on the right-hand side of that offensive line. And that's, I, I, again, I, I think that they're going to, I think it's going to be a different game plan coming out against Green Bay. They're going to be the ones that dictate on offense. They're going to line up and they're going to try to push them forward and they're going to run the football effectively. They're not going to let Ritter get out of his comfort zone and start throwing it all over the field. So I give Arthur Smith all the credit in the world that they were able to adjust during the game and take Brian Burns out of it, essentially. 
where he was blowing up the play. The last regime, they would have – and, again, I know it's a different quarterback too. Matt Ryan is a guy who is not going to run around and, and find ways to make plays, but the fact that Arthur was able to adjust in that game, the fact that he was able to kind of be patient, work his offense, not get out of a rhythm, and and, and not worry about targets, how many receptions Kyle Pitts has, how many targets and catches – does Drake London have? I don't care if we drafted those guys high. If we're winning football, if Desmond Ritter or sorry, if Drake London goes the entire season without a catch and we're 17 and 0, I'm not going to worry about it. He can have zero receptions on the stat sheet every week. Now, again, that won't happen, but my point is as long as we're winning football games, we have a guy in our head coach that can adjust and think on the fly and react to what is being in front of him. The last guy couldn't do any of that. And that's why I love Arthur Smith. Every time I read and hear something from Arthur Smith, I love him more and more and more as a football coach. So again, we'll preview the game tomorrow, but it's going to be a a really good test for the Falcons. We'll see what happens uh, in all of this, but I expect a little bit of a different game plan going into Sunday. All right, thank you so much for making Hitting Hard your first listen. Be sure to go into whatever podcast platform that you listen on and let us know that you're an everyday listener to the show. We do ask you uh, to leave us a comment. Let us know that you're listening in five days a week. We do thank you so much for being a part of our community. We ask you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. You can get the latest episodes of Hitting Hard as soon as they become available. Also, check us out on the SiriusXM app and give me a follow on my personal Twitter page at JMCH316. We'll be back with you tomorrow. We'll talk about Falcons and Packers. We'll preview the game. This has been Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 